Good afternoon, Delters. So today we're just going to take a quick, quick review of uh, some of the topics that we review during our semester, which is almost done. Uh, the first one uh, that we're going to take a quick, quick review is about the Bruce and Block God and the difference that we can find thinking about these two words. Just remember that, as we said, this will be a um, result that will be the result of a damage to blood vessels, depending in the, the causes. When we say, when we know that we have an injury because of the uh, vessel of capillaries are injured, these uh, blood vessels that are burst or bursting uh, will leak blood, and then this blood will become trapped and uh, began to decolorate the surface of the skin and it will be the result of a bruise that will appear as a notice noticeable mark on the outer layer of the skin. As we remember, these bruises can be uh, formed after a hard impact, an injury, falling down or even breaking a bone. The symptoms, as we said, this uh, black and blue appearance of the bruise, uh, it's uh, due to the lack of oxygen in the trapped blood. And as we uh, saw before, this uh, bruise will change the color as it uh, becomes to heal. It will be reddish at the beginning and then it will change into dark blue, purple, blackish color. And over uh, the days, uh, it will resolve and uh, later will fade completely. As we uh, said before, some of the risk factors for these bruises will be taking some drugs, including those blood thinners, uh, uh, as an example, the warfarin, and also those over-the-counter drugs, such as aspirin. We also know some fish oil supplements will be a, a risk factor for uh, having a bruise, and even some vitamin. Of course, we always must remember those deficiencies or bleeding disorders that may that can also make a person uh, be suffering for bruises. As we said before, as uh, we get older, this uh, make uh, our skin and blood vessel more fragile and, of course, more... Um, easy to to have a, a burst or not even a very hard impact but sometimes just a touch of, uh, of someone the difference from the bruise is uh, that the blood clot uh, it's a uh, uh, it uh, is formed as a result of the uh, the healing of a injury of a cut and this uh, blood clot is a form of a clump of blood and it uh, it's usually formed in a deeper tissue or even inside the blood vessels. That's why it is not really visible. And as we said, it's a part of the this natural process of healing. Depending on the place that the the, the blood clot is formed, we can also call it thrombus, as we can see, because it's uh, formed inside the blood vessels. And as we know, even high blood pressure or diabetes can damage the leaning of the blood vessels. So those tissues can uh, result in a thrombus forming. As we know, these uh, uh, blood clots can also be uh, secondary for uh, hypercoagulation. And as we know, this uh, condition can block the flow of blood and oxygen to those parts of those tissues. That's why they always become a medical emergency because they can become a life-threatening uh, situation because of the effects on the blood and the oxygen flow. Examples of these uh, conditions are uh, the stroke, which uh, it's, uh, it's stopping the, the flow of all uh, blood and oxygen on the brain, a heart attack when we talk about our, our heart. Uh, if we talk about the lungs, we can have this pulmonary embolism, 
And talk about the stomach, we can have the mesenteric ischemia. Uh, we also must be considering a deep vein thrombosis, which is also very common. And as we know, the risk factors for blood clots can be people who are sitting for prolonged periods and uh, also we will have a genetic predisposition. Uh, if we are uh, smoking uh, frequently, even pregnant women, if, uh, as we know, uh, if we are getting old, people from age uh, 60 or more can be in a uh, more risk. Uh, of course, overweight or obese people are in a higher risk. And uh, if a uh, woman has uh, been uh, treating with the uh, hormone therapy, then they are in a high risk. There's also a condition if we had a recent surgery. Okay, our second uh, topic is scoliosis. And as we remember, we said that idiopathic scoliosis is uh, one more than 50 or 60% of cases uh, presented as uh, one of the most common congenital disorders. Most of the times, the cause is unknown, and it's known as the idiopathic scoliosis. And it, it is uh, this condition, it's a uh, medical condition in which the spine of a person will be making a sideways curve that can be in a different shape, like an S or even like a C. And we we have to remember uh, the difference between an escalated attitude or the uh, posture and the real scoliosis. We always must remember when our patient has a real scoliosis, this uh, curvature will not disappear when we would try to correct uh, the posture. As we knew also when we talk about appendicitis, we knew that maybe because of the pain, we can have an escalated attitude or posture. But the fact is, if we return to the right uh, postural position, that curvature will disappear, which, not, it's, which is not happening in the real scoliosis. So that will be the difference that curvature that disappears or not. We can also, or we must also remember that we have major or primary curves, which are the ones that are the biggest curve in the dorsal spine. And we uh, must remember that under or above those uh, major or, or primary curves, we can uh, find uh, compensatory curves, which are called minor or secondary curves. As we know, these, uh, two, these uh, secondary curves are helping us to maintain the global balance of this spinal and uh, the head orientation so we can uh, walk uh, as normal as possible. As we knew, the diagnosis for scoliosis can be sometimes very difficult because when the curves uh, are uh, after 30 degrees of deformity, it's when we can uh, find out there's uh, a deformity on the spine. And as we said, sometimes it's uh, when we are making sports or when we are taking a shower or something that we can find out that there is something wrong with our spine. So the curvatures must be more than 30 degrees to be noticed. Some of the causes for scoliosis, as we can uh, remember, it's uh, cerebral palsy, muscular dystrophy, hereditary factors. We can also have some birth defects affecting the development of the bones of the spine or even injuries to the or infections of the spine. According to the side of the curve, we know that we have different uh, names for the scoliosis. Uh, talking about cervical vertebrae, we know we we consider those uh, seven uh, spines like C1 to C7. If we talk about thoracic vertebrae, we have those 12 uh, vertebrae we consider from T1 to T12. 
lumbar vertebra, those five, L1 to L5, the sacrum, and the coccyx, which are fused when we are uh, an adult. And also, uh, we will have this uh, classification, cervical, thoracic, thoracic, thoracolumbar, and lumbar. Depending on the site of the scoliosis, it's uh, the name that we will call. We can also have like the combination of two of, of them, like thoracic and lumbar, uh, which uh, comes from the apex in the dorsal spine and in the vectors of the lumbar vertebra, or the other chance, which is the thoracic double or triple, which means the presence of two or three different curves in the thoracic spine. Uh, thinking about the geology of the scoliosis, uh, we uh, uh, in the first uh, position we have the idiopathic, which, as we said before, represents more than sixty percent of the scoliosis. We can also think about the congenital or osteogenic scoliosis, paralytic, neurofibromatosis, or von Recklinghausen's disease, and uh, also, as we said, infections or tumor or traumas. Now, what is an hemivertebra? As we said, this is a complete formation failure, segmentation, or the combination of a vertebra. As we know, this vertebra is not completely formed, and it's just uh, looking like a triangle. As it grows, as the, as the person grows, of course, this is uh, deformating the, the spine and making those curvatures. As we know, this uh, hemivertebra in the thoracolumbar area will display a faster rate of progressions than those one in the lumbar region. Uh, when we talk about this idiopathic scoliosis that has less than 25 degrees up to 30 degrees, this uh, might be resolutive and corrected only when the child is growing. But if this uh, curve gets worse, then the spine will also be rotating or even twisting in addition to those curving side to side. As a result, when we talk about this thoracic scoliosis, we will note that it has the highest expected impact because those ribs that are, are deformed are uh, also uh, making the presence of the hump. As we knew, as we talk, lumbar scoliosis will origin a de degenerative phenomena because it's a, it has an asymmetric articular wear. And of course, uh, this will result in a pain in the uh, adult uh, age. Some of the uh, tools that we have to diagnose scoliosis, the first one is uh, the maneuver of Adams. We have also the radiographic theories. We can also have an axial tomography or CT scan. We can also have the magnetic resonance, the method of COP, the bending test, and the research method. We review the maneuver of Adams, which uh, we talk. Uh, we said that is the uh, how we can take a look of the lumbar and dorsal region. When we ask our patient to flexion the trunk and the superior members and making a pendular position, as we knew, if we have a true scoliosis, this deviation of the middle line and the asymmetry of the trunk will be evident and will demonstrate the presence of the hump. And we can see on the picture on the right. As we can remember, we can see the evidence for those uh, hump. We see the, sp the spine rotates to one side and the ribs are pushing out the posterior and it appears higher. Another signs and symptoms from scoliosis can include plagiocephaly, which is the asymmetry of the school, uneven shoulders, uh, one shoulder will be uh, appear more prominent than the other. Of course, also the uneven weights. Again, one hip will be higher than the other. And as we said, the existence of the hump, which is the prominent area 
caused by the vertebral and ribs rotation. The method of cough, as we said, is the measure of the scoliosis angle, and we said it will be evident when it's higher than 30, uh, 30 degrees. Some of the complications for this uh, scoliosis will be the lung and heart damage, back problems, and of course the appearance. The different types of treatment can uh, uh, include physiotherapy, the corset or bracing, surgery, the fusion, which is called arthrodesis, or even the costectomy. Uh, we said that if we have a rigid and short curves, maybe bracing is uh, not recommended, but bracing could be useful to treat the secondary curves. Okay, our third uh, topic is uh, when we talk about pregnancy trimester, and we say that a typical pregnancy has three trimesters. We divide it into three trimesters, and we said it lasts around 40 weeks of pregnancy, which we call WOP. And as we know, we have first, second, and third. And depending on the weeks, we say that first trimester comes from the first to the 12th week of pregnancy, second trimester, 13 to 26 uh, uh, weeks of pregnancy, and uh, finally the third uh, trimester, 37th to 14th weeks of pregnancy. And we say that uh, 40 weeks is the usual time frame, but a full-term baby can be born as early as 37 weeks and as late as 42. So the range uh, for this uh, um, full-term baby, it's from 37 to 42 weeks of pregnancy. As we knew, we will have uh, very different uh, situations in each one of the trimesters. Let's take a look. And as we said, the first trimester from the first uh, to 12 weeks, it's very important for a baby's development because most of the major organs and structure began to form. Uh, when the baby is about four to five weeks, then it looks more like a human baby. At this time in this semester, we can uh, hear the hair rate uh, as early as eight weeks, but most of the time, the, the best uh, uh, time to hear the baby's heart, it's about 12. 11 to 12 uh, weeks of pregnancy. In this time, the eyelids will stay uh, closed, protecting the baby's eyes. And at this time, the fetus is uh, ready to make the fist. All the genitalia uh, can be uh, shown at this time, and we could uh, see the difference between a boy and a girl. In this, in this uh, trimester, it's very common that our women will be uh, feeling this morning sickness or nausea and vomiting, which is due to the pregnancy. It's very common from six to eight weeks of pregnancy. And the fact about this uh, morning sickness is the, that uh, the name could uh, make us confused. But as we know, this, is, uh, this sickness is happening all day. Many women can be even sick every morning, every afternoon, or even uh, during the night, okay? So this is uh, morning sickness, uh, we said, is uh, um, very uh, common for these uh, hormonal changes which makes more emotional or, or pregnant women. And in this uh, trimester, our pregnant woman will also be experiencing fruit cravings or aversions. Uh, she will be very sensible to the smell. Uh, sometimes the breast tenderness is also very common. On the second trimester, uh, which comes from the 13 to 26 week of pregnancy, there's uh, still some parts of the body uh, forming, uh, the skeleton, muscle tissue, skin, eyebrows, eyelashes, 
fingernails and two nails, blood cells, Tate's birds, footprints and fingerprints and hair. And now uh, we can uh, feel what we call the quickening, which means the baby is now moving. Uh, in this uh, trimester, uh, our pregnant woman will uh, also feel those nipple changes. Uh, it's, uh, those nipples are becoming darker uh, every time and they can also leak some milk. And those stretch marks all over the abdomen, uh, the skin of the abdomen may appear. Our third trimester uh, begins from the week 27 until the baby is born. It means until delivery. At this time, most of those organs and body systems has already uh, formed, but now they had to get uh, some uh, weight. They are continue to grow and of course they will continue to mature. Now uh, the baby at this point it's uh, making some uh, breathing motions uh, 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 helping the to be ready for the life after birth. Other symptoms that a pregnant woman may experience in these uh, third trimesters include uh, heartburn, swollen feet, insomnia, Again, mood swings because of the hormones, and as uh, we know, the leakage of milk for the breast. As we said, breast and nipple changes, such as darkening, uh, our women will be uh, uh, having a frequent urination. And of course, uh, by this time, we will find out anxiety about uh, how the baby is going to be born and how the family will be. Uh, taking care of a new baby. There are some people that call the fourth trimester of postpartum a time where the after the baby is born, the women are feeling like uh, instead of anxiety, now they will become a depressed uh, motion. And it could be also the result because of the fluctuation in hormones. As we know, some women may experience this postpartum depression, which is called baby blues, and it's that feeling of sadness uh, of those uh, women, and it is uh, most uh, commonly present on the first few days after the delivery. So as we know, baby blues is not uh, talking about the color, but it's talking about the emotion. And as we know, it's also called postpartum blues. Our next topic it talks about uh, what it's uh, uh, taking us uh, to be in these online sessions to be at home, and uh, we talk about which uh, this excitement around the hydroxychloroquine for treating the COVID nineteen, and we talk about that this medicine is usually an intermalarial drug. Uh, it's been used like in the nineteen forties. And it's uh, very common to use it for autoimmune disorders. As we knew this hydroxychloroquine, it's sold only when the doctor prescribes it. And this is a disease modifying anti rheumatic drug. Uh, the goal to use this hydroxychloroquine is to lessen pain, reduce inflammation, improve or maintain the function, and prevent long term joint damage control of systemic involvement. It is used in rheumatoid arthritis in the Strohan syndrome, in the systematic lupus erythematus or SLE, and in, in, the, in which it is routinely used for control the symptoms. And according to the Thomas Dornet, who is a rheumatologist in the Charité University Hospital in Berlin, the Hydroxychloroquine is the only known therapy so far for primary Strohan syndrome. People are uh, taking uh, this hydroxychloroquine, uh, trying to uh, lease or to stop the the COVID nineteen, and it's uh, auto medicating with this drug. Of course, 
this uh, medicine, as all medicines, will have side effects that are really dangerous because people doesn't really know how much to take of the pills and because uh, the side effects are really, really uh, very, very uh, aggressive. So we have been hearing about cases of chloroquine poisoning. How this uh, uh, hydroxychloroquine is uh, working? They say uh, that in China they found out this chloroquine could inhibit the SARS-CoV in vitro. But of course they are not having any conclude results as uh, they use in humans. Uh, as we know, uh, this hydroxychloroquine, it's uh, uh, known as the hydroxychloroquine sulfate, and as we are looking for it at the drugstore, we find it under the brand name of Plaquenil. As we said, it is available in the United States and also in Mexico only by prescription. Okay, changing the point for the green stick fracture, we said these kind of uh, uh, fractures are uh, very important because most of the time will be present in the pediatric age. The mechanisms of injury, it's uh, very important for us to ask about how it happens. We must uh, take into account the location of the, of the fracture if there's any involvement of the soft tissue and how is the neurovascular status conserved. The joints below and above the site of the fracture should be also evaluated for uh, looking for any uh, occult fractures or even uh, multiple fractures. The treatments in a green stick fracture are most uh, of the time the cast immobilization, but we can also consider splinting. And it's very important for us the orthopedic follow up, okay? Because if we do not properly immobilize these uh, fractures, then we'll be have in a high risk of refracture or even a complete fracture. And if uh, the other possibility will be the displacement of the fracture. Uh, as we said, it, it's less commonly practiced, but it's splinting can be also uh, used to um, correct a uh, green stick fracture. Um, as we know, this uh, cast immobilization of this long bone should uh, last uh, approximately six weeks. And of course, those patients that has proximal fractures will require a closed orthopedic follow-up. When we think about the, the physical findings in a green stick fracture, we will find out that this patient will have a decreased range of motion uh, because of the pain or even because of uh, any displacement. And we can even look for ecchymosis over the injured area. We might also find edema if it is displaced. And we have to take a look of those soft tissue changes, uh, such as an aversation or laceration. And if uh, we have to take consider the neurovascular bundle, we must be looking uh, of any signs of injury. When we talk about the goal of the treatment for a green stick fracture, we have to remember it's to avoid the displacement of the uh, of the fracture and also the risk of a refracture. As we said, if it's not completely stabilized, then we have the risk or a refracture or a displacement. Uh, we said that the green streak fracture is uh, when the cortex and periosteum are interrupted only on one side of a bone and it's a bending injury because there's only an incomplete thickness fracture. Only one part of the cortex and the periosteum are interrupted and the other will remain 
totally uninterrupted. Why is it happen? Because as uh, in the pediatric age, there they have a very increased compliance. Those bones are very bowing and bending, and those injuries uh, will result in uh, less uh, stress than of, uh, the stress that will have an adult bone. So uh, this kind of uh, fractures because of this uh, bowing and bending uh, compliance will result in green stick, torus, and spiral injuries. So these are bending injuries more than a full thickness cortical breaks. And as we say, this could be the result of these calcified cartilage in pediatric bones because the radio of the collagen matrix is uh, uh, higher and they have a higher immature mature cross-link radio. So that's why we say in the children before the ossification, most of those pediatric bones are just calcified cartilage, which is very compliant. It's very flexible if we compare to the ossified bones of adults. Okay. We knew also that malnutrition is, uh, when we talk specifically about vitamin D deficit, will increase the risk of green stitch fractures uh, of the lung bones after a trauma because these uh, bones will be very weak. Uh, how could these uh, green stitch fractures uh, occur? Well, most of the times they will uh, be the result uh, of falling on outstretched arms, which is called FUSH, because we are trying to protect our uh, upper extremities by falling down. So we try to stop our falling with our uh, hands or, or, or fingers or arms. Something that is very, very uh, important is to remember that even though most of these green stick fractures are presented in the pediatric uh, population, we can also see a fracture in adults, a green stick fracture. It's not really common, but it is possible. When we talk about these uh, green stick fractures that uh, goes through the diaphysis and metaphysis, it's a cold green street fractures. But when it, it's involved in the physis, then we will uh, classify these fractures as a halter harris. As we can see, it's involved in the physis. Okay, again, we say because of the increased compliance of the pediatric bones, they will have more bowing and bending injuries. Uh, than uh, uh, an adult bone will have. These uh, green stick fractures, we had to remember, can also occur in the jaw and nose. In this uh, part, condylar fractures are the most common pediatric mandibular, mandibular fractures. Okay, our next topic, it's uh, the squint or estrabism. And as we knew, we must find out whether our patient has or not a squint uh, problem, because when we detect it on early stages, then we might have a very good prognosis. It's important for us not to wait too long or just overlook the treatment, because it can lead to a permanent vision loss. How how old our baby must be? to think uh, about this uh, estrabism is normal. We said at the time of four to six months old, these eyes usually will straighten out. Before this, it's uh, kind of normal to wander or cross the eyes. As we said, if we don't treat completely our, our, our squint, the brain will eventually suppress or ignore the image of the weaker eye which uh, will result in amblyopia or the lazy eye. It means this, 
this eye is unable to focus on the things and by the time it could become a, vi a permanent vision loss. We can also uh, damage the long-standing eye uh, and, and we can uh, damage the deep perception or stereopsis, which is the ability to see in the uh, third D uh, dimension. Just to remember, depending on the direction of the wandering of the eye, we can uh, divide these uh, four types of uh, um, misalignment. When we talk about esotropia, we know the eye will turn inwards. When we talk about exotropia, it will be the other way. It means outwards. Hypertropia, which comes upwards and hypotropia, which comes downwards. Again, hypotropia downwards, hypertropia upwards, exotropia outwards, and esotropia inwards. See also the difference between nearsightedness, which is called, it's called myopia, and farsightedness, which is hyperopia. And just remember that astigmatism is a a form or a blurry vision, and as we knew, screen is the misalignment of wandering of one or both eyes. We knew that the test uh, used to assess whether the patient has strabismus is called the Heisberg test or Heisberg corneal reflex test, and we might uh, determine whether our patient has or not the strabism. Our next topic is uh, ovarian cystadenoma. Just to remember, this ovarian cyst is a sac which has inside liquid or semi-liquid materials and it arises from the ovary. We must remember we have a very broadly classification which uh, uh, classifies the cyst in functionals or neoplastic and then after we have the neoplastic uh, uh, cyst, we know they can be benign or malign, okay? We know the ovarian ser serous cystadenomas are a type of benign uh, ovarian epithelial tumors, and these uh, serous cystadenomas are the most common type of ovarian epithelial neoplasm. About 60% uh, of those ovarian serous tumors, but the good thing about this is most of them will be uh, benign. How is the clinical presentation of these uh, ovarian cystadenomas? Most of the time they are asymptomatic, but the way they are presented is when we find out those cysts that can grow like really, really big will be a displacement the adjacent structures, such as the loops of bowel or any adnexal torsions. We know that these uh, ovarian cystodonomas can be bilateral in 15% of the cases. And as we talk about the macroscopic appearance, we know that they usually could be composed of unicular or sometimes multilocular cyst. And most of the time they will be filled with clear weighted fluid. Some of the lining of the cysts uh, would be flat or also may contain small papillary projections. And as we knew, most of them could measure 10, per 10 centimeters in the average, but some of them, as we saw in our uh, class, we knew that they can really be extremely large, like our patient haha. <laughs> that has uh, this uh, cyst of uh, 26 kilograms. We can find this uh, cyst uh, with an ultrasound, looking for those uh, detectable septations, or we can also look at uh, those uh, CT scans, which uh, in which the T1 will uh, take into account the, the cyst content which is hypotense, or the T2, which the fluid is hyper intense. 
and the T1C when we use the contrast uh, liquid and then we can find out. The surgical options include the resection or the ophorectomy. Okay, now talking about the club foot, we we know this it's a congenital talipes echinovirus, and some of the syndromes that uh, can be uh, along with the club foot includes the arthrogryposis, the constriction band syndrome the tibial emimelia, and the diastrophic duastromus. We note that in this, um, in this uh, situation, the Achilles tendon will be too short, and it will cause that the foot will stay pointed, also known as the fixing the foot in echinus. It's also turned in and under, and as we know, all the bones of the foot and the ankle are present, but they are misaligned, due to the difference in the muscles and tendons that act, act, that, act, that are acting on the foot. We know that in, uh, somehow or in some time the, the Achilles uh, tendon will need a very small incision as an uh, integral part of this possibility management uh, which is a really, really very small uh, incision, but it will help the Achilles tendon to grow and make it uh, uh, help to flex upward the ankle. Pertinitanium means through the skin, and as we know, the incision is really very small. We have two phases for the Ponseti treatment. The first one is the treatment phase where the deformity is corrected completely. As we know, it should begin as early as possible. Uh, and the best is to start the first week of life. And what we will do is be gently manipulation and cast the, 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 the foot on a weekly base. It will last maybe four to six weeks. And after this treatment phase, we will have the maintaining phase where we are going to use a brace to prevent the recurrence. This orthosis should be worn 23 hours a day for at least three months and then uh, during the night time for a lot of several years. If we do not use this orthosis correctly, then it will result a recurrence in the good foot deformity. As we said, the risk factors is that males are two times uh, more likely to, to have a, a club foot. If one of our parents has a, a club foot, then we have a true chance of getting it. But if both parents, mom and dad, has the club foot, then the chance is uh, uh, almost 15%. As we said, we began at the first week. And our goal for this treatment is to improve the way that our child's food looks. And also, it is uh, better to do it before he begins to, to walk. And because we're trying to prevent long-term disabilities. If we treat our uh, club food in a, in a good, in, in an on time and uh, with the both treatment and uh, uh, conservative time then the result it's very it's very good one our prognosis is very good just to remember the four uh, components of the congenital talipes echinobarus the midfoot forefoot hindfoot and hindfoot echinus which is called cave hindfoot barus the forefoot adductus midfoot cabus and ankle echinus. Okay, coming to our next uh, topic, just to remember uh, which are the long acting reversible uh, contraceptive methods. We remember that long acting means it, it's uh, for a long, long time to be used, reversible because we can just uh, stop taking them or using them anytime. And uh, 
we we know that this uh, long-acting reversible contraceptives uh, includes the implant uh, and the IUDs. The IUDs, as we know, are we have five kinds in the United States. We know the level nine steroid releasing intrauterine devices, which are called NNG, LNG IUDs, and we have the copper containing IUD. These um, IUDs are inside, must be inside the uterus or womb, and. The two types of art that we have available, as we said, are the intrauterine devices, and the other one is the implant. As we know, the IUDs are two kinds, the copper or paragard, which uses only copper, and those hormonal IUDs, Kylena and Lileta, Mirena and Skyla. Just to remember, how uh, long this uh, hormonalized IUD can last. So as we can see, we have different years. And we know that we can also use uh, this uh, morning after pill to prevent uh, em uh, pregnancy used as an emergency contraception. Talking about how we can uh, examine our women that are using this IUD, we must remember that we can also have the risk. And we talked about the migration of these intrauterine devices, looking for all kinds. As we know, m many people, many women are using these intrauterine devices all around the world, but because they are highly effective and they are reversible, but also we have inherent risk, as we say. We can find the migration of the IUD from its normal position. We can also have the exposure of the uh, IUD. We can use uh, find the displacement into the endometrial canal. The uterine perforation are the embedment of the IUD. We are going to uh, use those uh, ultrasounds to find out where is the IUD. But also the conventional radiography, the uh, a simple abdominal X-ray, so we can find out where is the IUD, or even the CT scan. When we are thinking about this IUD has migrated into the abdominal cave, and just to remember what to do if we have the missing uh, string of the IUD, using the ultrasound, using the uh, antiposteral or lateral radiographs or even the CT abdomen uh, scan and just uh, define whether we decide to leave the IUD or if it's gone uh, far, far away then maybe we'll require the surgical intervention. Another situation we talked in this uh, semester was the appendicitis in children and just to take a, a quick review, we remember those symptoms that are typically in the right um, side of the abdomen, but always taking in account that it's a very, very frequent uh, illness for pediatric age. And just to remember, it's not really common before the age one or two, because in that situation, the appendix it has a funnel uh, shape or is funnel shape. Remember that the localization, localization of the appendix most of the time will be in uh, the retrocecal uh, position. And again, just to remember that most of the time or mostly will be on the right side. But in this uh, situation, as we said, we can find it on the left side just yes, remember this uncorrected malrotation uh, when we do the inverse totalis and gastroschisis and omphalocele just to remember also that we will be um, asking for those complete blood count looking for leukocyte uh, count and elevated neutrophils 
and also pandemias and just to remember also the C CRP or C reactive protein, which we said uh, the higher the, the C C CRP level will be, the more inflammation in our body. So they we must uh, have both of them. And also uh, we can use the X-ray scan to see those levels, those water levels. We can use the ultrasound to look at the appendix or even the CT scan. And just to remember what to do if we are thinking about a pain on the pediatric age. Just to finish with this one, taking about those common breast problems, we remember that the breast cancer is one of the most common uh, cause of non-cutaneous cancer. Just to remember which are the most commonly uh, symptoms in the patient, which are purple, purple breast masses, nostalgia, and nipple discharge. Okay, what are the causes for this breast, breast cancer? Just remember the family history is very important. If we're taking any uh, hormonal therapy, if we began our period very early, or on the other hand, we finish the period very late, if we are exposed to any carcinogenous or or substances that can be harmful. And just remember that we will find these uh, palpable rises uh, not even in women, but also in men. We must be uh, doing this clinical breast examination in all women, looking for those uh, palpable breast mass in, masses in men. Okay, and also nostalgia, as we said, it's a uh, we can find it in the two or uh, thirds of all breast pain causes, and we know that this is most common, uh, most commonly present in women in the twenties and thirties. And as we know, we must have a very detailed history. Where is the location of the pain? What kind of pain? It is very severe. No, if it's only one side or the other and if it is related to the period time. We must also know the medication story if we have any musculoskeletal triggers, if the, it has an impact on our daily function. And of course, as we said, very, very important if there's any family history of breast cancer. Uh, talking about the nipple discharge is uh, our primary aim to distinguish between a normal lactation Non purple lavalactoria and the pathologic discharge that we talk. Just to remember the difference between the uh, nipple discharge, we remember we have a physiologic discharge and a pathologic discharge. And as we knew, if it's a physiologic, it could be the result of a compression. Most of the time it's bilateral and it comes from multiple dogs. And the other, on the other hand, the pathologic discharge will be spontaneous, unilateral, of a single duct, or can even be bloody. Okay. When we have a, a benigmas, most of the time they will be smaller, mobile, smooth, and regular. And when we talk about those malignant masses, are larger, fixed, hard, and heterogeneous in texture. We must be looking for those masses and uh, have a documentation. We recommend the diagnostic mammography for women uh, or about around 40 years old and the ultrasonography for women younger than 30. We can also uh, use the uh, MRI. And we can also remember this clinical imaging can help us also to have a guide biopsy.